All right, so this is gonna be my next sort of franchise slash series I'm gonna talk about, which is the Friday 13 series. The reason why I'm talking about it now is because it's going to be the fourth anniversary, even though it's been passed. The first movie came out in 1980. Four years later, it's been passed that I still wanna talk about it. And in November, there's going to be Friday 13 on, you know, Friday the 13th. So, like, you know, what? good time to talk about, you know, this series after Halloween and 31 Days of Four. So, I said, like, you know what? Fuck it. Why not just talk about this? 12 movies. So, the movie was filmed at Camp Nobi. Bow school in new jersey the hell is that is that still there apparently camp was still in operation and had like the memorabilia from the movie so they actually went to an actual camp i thought it was well i know like the bathrooms were built for set but the actual like land was actually a camp that's cool interesting obviously the budget on this is super low it's 500 000, and obviously it made a lot it made close to 39 million dollars in a box office so One, two, three. that's super successful it, it, it's not i mean it's very clear even i think one of the producers said that this is a ripoff of halloween like they were going off of the slasher craze after 1978 bunch of movies just came out in the slasher genre we're just like oh, just do this copy this and this movie this franchise it spawned a franchise out of the fire 13 don't know why though i don't know why this movie's so special uh i'll get to that later which is what i find interesting about it but anyways uh yeah i already did this most, most location were already there crew had to build bathroom set so unlike halloween the music in this film there's barely none there's the vi i'm assuming violent i don't know my instruments but with the violin going back and forth like dun, 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 dun. other than that there's not a lot you know it's just kind of like stalking uh young teens getting killed like there's no music which i don't know how i feel about that especially this type of franchise in this movie it doesn't need music but it's like i don't know i was kind of bored out of my mind during the movie I'm not gonna lie it's pretty dull but yeah I, I did find interesting that there's barely to no music in this movie except for the you know the beginning i didn't know this the scene the snake was not scripted the idea was from Tom Savini after an experience in his old cabinet during filming. The snake was indeed real and was included in the on-screen death. So I thought the snake was fake. That was just kind of like drawn out scene like, oh, there's a snake in the cabinet. Ooh. And like, why, why are they, why, why is this being shown? You know, it doesn't need to be shown. But apparently it was actual snake. So, you know, R.I.P. snake. Composer Henry Manfredini. Oh God. No, I'm not his last name. Anyways, Henry came up with the classic. K -K 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 vocals so you actually didn't i thought it was like i don't know just jason saying random words but it's like three kill and then three mama like kk kill mama mama came from this as well uh, it is pretty creepy i remember watching this first time i know by the way i have seen all of these but i remember watching me like oh that's kind of creepy you know kill kill mama mama and it's very iconic now so good on them sean s cunningham has been quoted saying that the type of actors that he sought for was good looking kids who you might see in a pips commercial which is true kind of like the cw now oh you see these good looking actors which i don't mind you know i don't mind at all they move we went up against films like The Shining, Just to Kill, The Fog, and Prop Night because it was the 18th highest grossing film of that year. Yeah, pretty hard hitting movies there. The Shining, The Fog, and Prop Night probably made a bit more money than this. Hard to top, especially The Shining. So, I said previously, this was inspired by both Halloween, the slasher movie, Meatballs, 18 sex comedy set in a summer camp, which had come out within a year and a half before both were big hits, focusing on young, on the youth market. So, yeah, again, Halloween thing, everyone knew about the but Meatballs, young teen sex comedy thing, sure, why not? Well, why the hell not? Jason is not mentioned by name until one hour and 60 minutes into the film. So, I mean, I guess everyone knows this now, but obviously Jason is not the killer in this movie. It's his mother, Pamela Voorhees, who starts killing teens because they let his son drown in the summer camp. And these teens were busy having sex. So anytime there's new counselors coming in, she just has flashbacks and memories of like Jason drowning. It's like, I gotta kill these naughty ass kids because they let my son drown. So yeah, it's interesting. Jason Voorhees, well known for, you know, he's, he's the icon of the series. Like, everyone knows just voice because of him but kind of interesting where the film started off with his mother being the killer and not him himself i don't know just has that ever happened before i don't think this never ever happened before so i don't know i thought that was pretty interesting to find out so we're putting the working title for the script was long night at camp blood which i'm assuming a lot of generic slashers were named like this like selling night deadly night that's a one-on franchise as well but it sounds just so not out there but dumb i don't know like long night long night at camp camp blood is i don't know would have been another generic slash apparently 
Betsy Palmer, actor who played Pamela, said that when she first read the script, she said, what a piece of shit, and threw the script across the room to the trash. And the script writer Victor Miller was at the conference and heard this comment. Adrian King patted him on the back, consoling. Palmer said that she didn't thought about it and said she needed some money for a new car, and the movie would probably come and go very quick and no one would ever see it, and they would all be gone. She decided to take the job. Little did she know the movie would become super well known and in a main thing, and super just loved by a lot of fans. Okay, so she hated the script. She, I mean, she was barely in the movie, by the way. The last 10 minutes, okay, is like actually scary and good. The rest of the movie is pretty boring. Not gonna lie, it's it's dull as hell. It's kind of shocking that this film started a franchise with 11 sequels and entries. And it's like, I don't know, maybe but people back in 1980 were a bit different, but 40 years later now, in 2020, watching this movie, it is a slog. It is a slow, very, very slow, slow movie. With a couple good kills and like a good like last 10 minutes. Really, if I'm being completely honest. Couldn't have viewed this movie by a, as a way to pay the bills, but it ended up working well. Yeah, if we're just making this movie just to pay bills and, and prove to executives that, you know, he could make money based off of a film titled Friday the 13th and then just ended up way beyond his expectations. Well, okay, this is just another, like, I don't know why the script was written in two weeks. These movies, man, like, they are written so quick. It's amazing how they even get the film together, honestly. And, like, I, well, I guess going back to how important this film was, the reason why it's probably because the script was, like, 30 minutes worth of material, like, actual movie material, and they needed to stretch it for, like, a full-length movie, an hour and, like, 20 minutes, 80 minutes, 90 minutes. So, yeah, two weeks, that makes sense. I was interested. Most of the stars in the movie were actually Broadway stars who were sent over by the, you know, casting agency from Broadway, which, okay, but I don't know. Every, you know, when you start looking up the facts and trivia, everything's just kind of starting just to make sense because, not well, first of all, none of these actors can act. Like, they're in Broadway, right? I don't know shit about Broadway, but, you know, these are young actors at the time, so they weren't, you know, well thought out and knew how to act well, so you get, like, half a act. You know, not horrible. There's some, but it's okay. It's passable. Couldn't have always felt that the MPAA held them to a higher standard after this film due to both its success and its belief that other producers would point to as an example that they should be allowed to get with stuff, too. Yeah, the MPAA, man, they are just on, like, specifically this series, on their asses. Like, you know, the seventh movie I'll talk about whenever we get to it. They really butchered that film because they didn't want, you know, real life, like, killings on screen, which it won't happen. Like, a human me cannot rip off another person's head with their bare hands, no matter how strong you are. That's just not possible. So, I, I don't know. I, I get it why. They don't want kids seeing this stuff. No human can do that. So, I don't know. Kind of dumb. Kevin Bacon is in the movie. This is, I think this is his first movie. Kevin Bacon shaved his armpits for the bedroom scene. Yeah, this is like young ass Kevin Bacon, like early 20s. We're seeing him here. He's in like Footloose and now he's in, he's in X-Men First Class. Like he's in, in future, like he's a well-known star. It's kind of interesting seeing him here, kind of being young and, and a horny teen, I guess. I don't know. It, it was it was cool. It was also kind of weird. It's like, oh, this is Kevin Bacon. He's, he's just here. He had to get a start somewhere. So that was cool to see. Alice is revealed to have a brief affair with the head counselor, Steve, for moving into an on and off relationship with Bill. Although Alice's age of 19 makes her 11 years younger than Steve. Yeah, that's, I guess I'll get into the film now or back and forth, but that scene where he like touches her cheek or face, kind of cresting her, her face as if they had something going on. I was weird. And I guess they had a affair thing. Like I, I found it worried. This guy is a counselor. He's 10, 11 years older than her. And apparently they had a thing together. It made sense. But yeah, it was just, I don't know, it was weird. And last one I will mention is Jason's father is never referenced in the movies. However, in the comics and novels, he's referred to as Elias Voorhees. A very cool and abusive husband and father to Jason. Yeah, they just never mention him. I think they were gonna bring him, like mention him in the sixth movie, but just never did. I think. Maybe look that up again. But would have been interesting to see if his father just somehow play into it since this franchise goes all sorts of ways in the later films. Alright, that was the last one. Now let's get to the actual film, which opens up in 1958. We've seen two teens having sex and it's killed by a mysterious person because they're naughty, they're bad. And we cut present time. I'm gonna assume it's 1980, because the movie came in 1980. We meet Hitchhiker slash counselor who meet this truck driver and he's the exp like the explainer guy you know the every film they have that scene where they just have to explain everything expository stuff blah 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 bunch of kids not kids uh counselors died and a kid drowned blah 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 and then we meet our main final girl alice who is okay i'm not gonna lie i'm not gonna remember any of the other counselors names because they're forgettable except for kevin bacon it's kevin bacon bacon man right but alice again as i mentioned earlier she has this thing with counselor that older counselor is gone for quite a bit of time he's really a relevant and all the other counselors will meet and then this one counselor who we meet in the beginning she hitchhikes into this jeep turns out this is the jeep of the killer the mysterious killer and you know she's like hey, hey this is my camp she goes away she just has to jump out like a badass goes into the wood and we get her first no not a first kill but we get like our third kill where her neck <laughs> 
get slit and there's blood coming out good kill again movie itself is dull it's still quite shocking how this spawned the franchise but i don't know like the 1980s were a different time but the prosthetics for her neck to get slit that was good decent kill there's some other ones here as well the day she dies she they she they mention her but she's gone one thing oh god this so the reason why this film is boring they had to fill in time for it, a full -length movie and they don't have enough material for 30 minutes or 40 minutes of the film honestly so there's like long and drawn out shots and like scenes that don't need to be there. like the snake scene that didn't even be there we see alice i think cooking or heating up water and we see that full fucking scene i don't need to see that shit just cut to when she's already done cooking or heating up water in, and then go to the scene or there's a scene of crazy ralph this old ass motherfucker he's like the funny creepy guy i like him and like you see him run away and ride his bike and that shot is held on for like 10 seconds way too long he should just got on the bike ride and then cut a couple seconds after that instead it's held for like an extra 10 to 15 minutes i don't know seconds like okay i don't need to see that but whatever it's it's there they need to fill in time it, it really drags along again there's a lot more you know skinny dibby playing around they're being horny teens alice the good girl there's she has friends and also i'm not gonna mention every kill i'm only gonna mention the kills that i i like honestly <laughs> so the next kill kevin bacon kill he's sleeping in there and he gets his neck stick through a goddamn blade from under the bed And it's a very iconic scene used in like trailers and like anniversaries and stuff blood starts splatting out and he's like open eyes open that's the last uh, last we see of kevin bacon which sucks he had to go he had to start somewhere so cool see him in this movie and then we go back to our older counselor the oldest one and by the way this is gonna be all over the place i don't know where like i was bored out of my mind so this is going all over the place we the older counselor he's in a diner he's drinking coffee his jeep is broken out he decides to go back to the camp but then gets stabbed like on and off screen he was like oh he dies like that's okay a dumb way to go honestly it was funny but it was like really that, that's that's the way this older counselor goes sure why not why not and then we get the final girl act where alice she starts seeing the bodies you know people upside down falling from stairs everywhere and uh, uh, there's a one point a body is thrown into a goddamn window which is was questionable honestly and then we see jeep come in and we meet pamela Voorhees, the mother to jason Voorhees, who heard that his son drowned years ago ago assuming this is 1980 1958 22 years ago she, she still has trauma from that which again i don't know how the fuck she threw a goddamn body in the window but you know it's she starts explaining to alice she's been killing people because she's still her chasing you know like there's this creepy vibe about her she's probably honestly out of the killers she's probably the most creepiest she has these crazy eyes and yeah she just hears chasing her in her head she hears voices like randy orange from wwe she hears these little little kid voices or specifically jason kill kill them mommy kill them you know like that's fucking creepy and so again it's alice versus pamela and again they f it feels like they fight for fucking forever for eternity dude it really is it's just oh, in this place and luckily it does near the lake or river she gets an axe and fucking cuts her head off decapitates her and her head is off she's like wait do i remember what happened and then we cut i think we cut and we see her in his little canoe and then a, a young looking jason comes up and grabs her from behind <laughs> Through the river turns out it was a dream turns out she's being invested by the cop saying that what happened she's like you know she says that you know she sounds crazy to everyone to the cop guy he's like jason you know he's still alive and it's like cops like no motherfucker dead he's dead and so at the end she the final girl alice she survives kills pamela kills the killer but also becomes crazy herself starts seeing jason and maybe is implied that he's still alive out there somewhere yeah i don't know man friday friends uh you must have really strong nostalgia for you i mean you really gotta have nostalgia for this first one because honestly not that great again as i said earlier it's slow it's a bit boring and dull it's not bad it's okay until and it gets good until the end again when pamela shows like, she's creepy these big crazy eyes starts saying that jason's like calling to her and shit that's creepy and it's so shocking that audiences back in 1980 were moved by this they liked it i don't know I mean, again it was different back in the day man it was 20 years before i was born so i don't know man maybe things are different now, back, back in the day but still crazy it's fucking i don't know how it started but yeah overall friday the 13th 1980 is okay it's nothing too special it's another generic slasher which somehow made a lot of money that's that's the most amazing part honestly okay just uh and i'll go on train with me with this franchise there's like a lot of the the characters and counselors who i'm not gonna remember there's a few exceptions but most of the movies i don't talk about and most of the characters i'm gonna forget except for the final guru and obviously the killer which is not jason in this movie but it will be jason in the sequels but yeah next is you know obviously friday 13 part 2